imagine that you're looking for a stable partner, right? So you might think, well, what do you want in a stable partner? And at least in principle, one of the things you don't want is too much mismatch between you and that person on the five fundamental dimensions. So for example, if you're really extroverted and you have a really introverted partner, you're going to engage in continual conflict about how much social activity the two of you should subject yourself to. And it's very, very difficult for people who broadly differ, widely differ on those dimensions to come to consensus because it's not just a matter of opinion, right? It's really a matter of different, if you're looking at extremes, of really different types of people. And the thing about introverts is they just don't enjoy large-scale social interaction that much. One-on-one, -on -one, they're often fine, but in a group, they don't like that, and they, it tires them out. Whereas a real extrovert, it's like you isolate them and, and they just wither on the vine because a huge part of what actually motivates them in a positive way is tangled up with social interaction. And so, if you're an agreeable person and you have a particularly disagreeable partner, you're also going to run into problems because the agreeable person will say, whatever you want, whenever, and the agreeable per or disagreeable person will say, well, I'd like to know what the hell you want for a change and be much more harsh and much more demanding in the situation. And the ag agreeable person is gonna find the disagreeable person harsh and unpleasant. And the disagreeable person is gonna find the agreeable person wishy-washy and unable to stand up for themselves. And again, that's, a, that's actually one of the primary sources of tension between men and women, because women tend to be higher in agreeableness than men. It's about half a standard deviation, which is quite, quite, a, quite, a, uh, quite a large difference by psychological standards. So th there's the problem with agreeableness. With conscientiousness, well, if you're conscientious, you're industrious and orderly. And orderly people seem to be sensitive to disgust, which is something we'll talk about in detail later. But our latest uh, idea is that, my, it's not my idea, it's actually the idea of my graduate student, Christine Brophy, um, is that industrious people find it um, unpleasant and unsettling to, to not be doing something. So it isn't so much that industriousness makes them happy or fills them with positive emotion. That would be more extroversion, right? Because extroversion is the positive emotion dimension. It's that industrious people can't stand sitting around doing nothing. And you know, this is speculation, but you know, human beings are obviously always engaged in the exchange of labor, especially the reciprocal exchange of labor. And you can imagine that um, in, a, in a community where everyone knows everyone, the people who work hard are going to be pretty irritated on a fairly chronic basis with the p people who are completely unproductive. And my suspicions are that plenty of people who were completely unproductive in the history of, of, our, of the evolution of our species were wiped out by people who were unhappy with their lack of productivity. And so I think, generally speaking, human beings have this sense of ethical obligation with regards to one another to share labor. And people who are conscientious really, really feel that. So they feel bad if they're not busily working on something that's productive all the time. And so the advantage to being with someone conscientious is, well, they're going to work like mad. But the disadvantage is they're, they're going to work like mad. So, you know, if you're looking for a partner that you want to relax with or have fun with or, or who isn't uptight, then a conscientious person is probably not a very good choice. On the other hand, if you're a conscientious person and you're living with someone who's really unconscientious, that's good because they might be able to help you relax, but you're not gonna be happy with them because they don't work nearly as hard as you do. But even worse, on the orderly dimension, you know, some of you have had roommates and maybe you're more orderly than your roommate. What does it mean? It means you're annoyed by mess before they are. And you don't have to be annoyed by mess much before your less orderly roommate for you to be the one that's always running around picking things up. And so actually, one of the things that's emerged from the psychometric analysis is that women are slightly more orderly than men. And I suspect that has something to do with the, un, what would you call it, inequitable distribution of housework. Because even if you're, imagine that your proclivity is to be triggered by disorder 25 seconds before your partners. Well, you're gonna end up, it doesn't take much difference for you to be the one that's always concerned about the mess first. So anyways, and so if you're a really orderly person and you live with a disorderly person, well, good luck getting along with them. They're going to regard you as like uptight and, and uh, uh, over concerned with details and, and, uh, and well, and unwilling to relax, that's for sure. And they're going to regard you as 
well, just a bloody mess, and how can anyone possibly live with someone like you? So another reason why it's useful to understand your personality is because I think it gives you a better crack at finding someone that you can actually live with over the long run. And we don't know what the optimal, I don't think you want to live with someone who's exactly like you because then both of you have the same strengths and weaknesses. And there's a bit of a problem there, right? Because maybe an agreeable person can use a bit of a disagreeable person around them to balance each other out and vice versa, right? So we don't understand the optimal balance for, for, for long-term thriving in a relationship. But I think we do understand the fact that if you're too different in your traits, that, those, that where you're different is going to constitute a chronic source of conflict. The next most important thing is trust, man. It's like, there, there's no marriage that's successful without trust. You guys, you've got to tell each other the truth. And one of the reasons that Jung believed that marriage as a, and an oath and a Carl Jung as a bond was necessary, it's really wise. It's like, you know, telling the truth to someone is no simple thing because there's a bunch of things about all of us that are terrible and weak and reprehensible and shameful and all of those things and they kind of have to be brought out into the open and dealt with and you're not going to tell the truth about yourself to someone who can run away screaming when you reveal who you are and so the, the marriage bond is something like okay here's the deal I'm going to handcuff myself to you and you're going to handcuff yourself to me and then we're going to tell each other the truth and neither of us are going to get to run away and so our, once we know the truth, then we're either going to live together in mutual torment or we're going to try to deal with that truth and straighten ourselves out and straighten ourselves out jointly. And that's going to make us, us more powerful and more resilient and more and deeper and wiser as we progress together through life. And, and I think that's absolutely brilliant because if you leave the back door open, man, you're going to use it, that's for sure. And the oath is there. And this was Jung's commentary on the spiritualization of of the human pair bond by Christian marriage, for example, which, which emphasized uh, the, the, what would you call it, the subordination of both members of the marital union to a higher order uh, personality that was embodied in the figure of the Logos. So the idea is that in, a, in, a, in the Christian marriage, for example, the man isn't the boss and the woman isn't the boss. The boss is the mutual personality composed by the seeking of truth in both of them and that's conceptualized as their, their joint subjugation to the Logos and that is absolutely dead on man it's like the ruler of your marital life should be your vow to tell each other the truth because like in hard times during your life when you've done something stupid and idiotic that might take you down and you don't have anybody that you can turn to you know if you have a partner that you can trust you can go say hey you know I made a big financial mistake man and it's really torturing me and I feel like a complete idiot and it's really dangerous and the person there is going to help you figure out what to do about it and they're going to know that when they make a stupid mistake and they're bloody well going to that they can come and talk to you and that you guys are going to work your way through it and that's a big deal and so um, well you look for someone that you're attracted to that you love and then you look for someone that you can bloody well trust and then you tell them the truth and and that way maybe you can get through life and you can have someone to weave the rope of your being with and together to make to make your joint rope stronger and you can have some continuity in your narrative and you can have children and then you can have grandchildren and like you can have a life man and there's nothing you're so fortunate if you can manage that the most important decision you can make above any on the face of the earth is deciding that no matter what happens in your life, no matter what happens, you're going to live in a beautiful state. What the hell does that mean? It means that you're not going to suffer. It means a beautiful state is that you're going to be happy, but that's only one. Or you're going to feel creative, or you're going to be passionate, or you're going to be in awe of something, or you're going to feel love. Any state that's a beautiful state is really the core essence of who you are without fear, right? All of our suffering as human beings, and I deal with people all the time. I, I mentioned you off camera, two people I, I coached yesterday. One's presidential candidate, and the other one is uh, a rap superstar, right? Both on the same day. And without naming any names, 
people that have everything by your point of view, most people's point of view. They have the fame and they have the love and millions of people love them and they have great economics, financial freedom and they have homes and they have, they have, they have the fashion, they have everything, they're the shit. I can't tell you how many of them are miserable. The majority are miserable, I'm not bullshitting. I'm the one who gets the phone call from the vast majority. When I say miserable, they're so used to it, some of them don't even realize they're miserable, but most do. They get a place where it's like, how do I keep this up? How do I keep out doing myself? How do I, you know, I built these 32 companies, how to keep all 32 going and make them all grow every single year. And that's not how life is, right? right. And then they worry about what will people think? What will they do? So the decision to say, I am not going to suffer. That if suffering arises, pain's one thing, suffering's another. Mm -hmm. Suffering is when you're like, and the way you suffer is you focus on yourself. Suffering comes when we obsess about ourselves, what we're getting or not getting, what we should have done, what we sh others should have done for us. It's the me, 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 me game. You, my dear friend, and I say this with no blowing smoke, your primary core is a giver, which is why you're prospering. You're not the me, me, me. You're like, how do I give more, do more, share more, create more? How do we do a better job for our clients? How do we do a better job for our, our, our internal customers who work with us, our partners? Your entire life is that. It's why you're prospering. And you're not feeling suffering. But when you do suffer, and I promise you do, <laughs> you correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, it'll be because you're worrying about something in the future. How's this going to happen? Will this come together? Suffering could be worry, could be anger, could be frustration. It's anything that takes you out of a beautiful state. And here's what people don't get. You can end suffering by stop focusing on yourself and focus on something you want to serve greater than yourself. Your children, your wife, your mission, your life. You can get out of it in an instant because the nature of the human mind is to constantly compare things. Your mind, your brain is a two million year old device and it is not designed to make you happy. It's designed to make you, it's designed to make you survive. Right. And that's why it's always looking for what's wrong. It used to be what's wrong is saber tooth tiger so I can protect myself. Now people are worried about what people think about them or do they have enough money when two thirds of the planet lives on two dollars a day. Right. and you're making $38,000, you're rich. The poorest right. of the poor in our country are considered rich. That's not, I'm not saying they should stay that way. Right. But you can only build on success. And so my view is, if you're watching, if you're listening to this, my goal would have you consider something. Life is short. We don't know how short it's going to be. But if you only had a week to live, I bet you wouldn't allow yourself to suffer over a little crap that makes you crazy normally. I think you would probably spend time with those you love, you would do what you love, you'd take on a sunset, you'd smell the air, you would take in everything in those so final true. moments that you possibly do. So my thing is why wait? Right. Right? Why wait? Why not just decide? But if I start to suffer, I know the solution because suffering is me obsessing about me. You might say, it's not me. I'm worried about my kids because they're not doing well. No, you're worried that you haven't done enough for your kids. It's about <laughs> you still, right? Yes. You know, you're worried about what was done or what you should have done or what shouldn't have done. And you can end that in an instant by becoming aware of it and saying, I have made the most important decision of all. I would say the 30 year old would say, this is what we're going to do this year. And it would be these huge numbers. And I developed a principle around the time I was 30, which is, most of us overestimate what we're going to do in a year and we underestimate what we're going to do in a decade and a decade happens that fast you'll blink your eyes and a decade point. will be here that and so great point. i really truly i everything i do is long term i think it's yeah. the biggest challenge we have in, in yeah. you know corporate america is everybody's looking the next quarter instead of you know the best business people the mark benioffs the steve wins the, the peter goobers and the people that i hang with they all are decade-long people when i was 14 i said this is how my life's gonna I decided, I said, in my 20s, I'm going to help. I want to have the skill to help anyone change their life. If I'm committed, they're committed, it's going to be done. I'll have the ability. So I got a bill to that, which I did. And then I said, in my 30s, at 14, I said, I'll do that with groups of people instead of one-on-one. -on -one. And then in my 40s, I'll do it with big groups. In my 50s, I'll do it with companies. In my 60s, I'll either do it in government as a servant there or in a religious context, because I'm a spiritual person, but I don't tell people what to believe religiously. But at that point, I've lived long enough, maybe I will. First of all, you're talking about stuff that I can relate to like so many others can relate to. I mean, you know, everybody got the same story. We just got different details. But like I always say, life is 10% what happens to you. It's 90% what you do about it. See, we're going to dive into a chapter from my new book. And it's chapter one, section one. This is very clear for people. So the first step is getting completely and brutally honest enough to say, I am tired of myself. 
When you say I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, that's the facilitator of change. That's when you're ready to say these words, no more excuses. No more excuses. I went to Kent State, I dropped out. I, well, I didn't drop out, I flunked out. Now that threw my life into a spiral, but because I didn't have a college degree, I could not let that stop me. And like you're doing, where you're saying, all my friends at this age are settling your careers, you don't even know if they're happy or not. Stop comparing yourself to others. So the first thing you do is stop focusing on other people. Instead, focus on being the best version of you that you can. Then you'll recognize that you deserve to sit at the big table with everybody else after you become the best that you can be. Now, once you've accepted that you have as much right to success and much right to succeed as anybody else, the next step is learning how to talk the talk. You have to get fluid in the language of success so you speak it with ease. Surround yourself with people who've accomplished their dreams and immerse yourself in the culture of achievement. You should never judge your success by other people's accolades. You, you judge your success by God's instruction to your life on how well along you are with that instruction. Because I found out something in life, the average human being is so mediocre that to be an, a genius, just do a little extra. You all missed that. People are so normal. To be an expert, just go one inch abnormal. And they think you're great. So don't judge your success by the masses, what they think of you. Judge yourself by what God told you to do. Can I put it another way? When experience is your best teacher, then progress is imprisoned. Experience could be a curse. I've been taught by my parents years ago that experience is the best teacher. I don't believe that anymore. Experience could cause you to stop progressing because you keep judging your dreams by your experience or your vision by your experience and you end up saying uh, I tried that before or I never saw anyone do it that way and you begin to use your experience to stop your progress this is why God always makes history with young people because old people got too much experience you all remember the story with David and Goliath the problem with Saul, who was the king, was he had experience. And he tried to put his experience on David. He told David, wear my armor, wear my shield, use my sword. David put it on David, this thing is too heavy. And he went out and fought the giant with something the giant never saw before. A sling. How do you fight a rock with a sword? The giant says, what is this thing he's using? The giant is trained, experienced with a sword. So he expected an experienced swordsman to come and fight him. But here comes a little boy with equipment he ain't never seen before. We need some people like that in the 21st century who come with some things that they ain't never seen at the office. Think of some ideas that wreck the whole system. That's why Stephen Jobs would always be in history as a great inventor. He keeps defying his own experience. I was reading his uh, a document, watching a documentary on him last two weeks ago, and they said that when the iPhone came out, they said to him, that's it. You're the ultimate, this is it. He said, no. And he came up with this idea about the iPad. And he said, the people in the company said, it will never work. Why? It's, it's an abnormal size. Either you got a computer or an iPhone. Put it in your pocket or put it in your briefcase. He said, this thing in the middle ain't gonna work. He says, look, we're gonna make this. Now the iPad is the most common machinery people use in the world. Sometimes you gotta defy your own board to take progress. Experience, consult your experience, but never let it rule you.
I love the phrase willpower, but willpower isn't something you conjure up. Willpower isn't something you drink. Willpower isn't something you download from Google. What you're talking about is how do I make the choices that are in alignment with my highest purpose and my highest vision for myself? That's what you really want to ask. See, your life is a physical manifestation of the choices that you made up until this moment. I'm going to say that again because that gets a little deep. And that can go over some people's head. That can hit you sometimes right between the eyes. And you got to hear it a second time. So here it goes. Your life right now, as it exists today, your finances, your weight, your relationships, your career, your self-esteem, your self-image, your spiritual awareness, all of that is a result of the choices that you've made up until this moment big and small. And just so you know, your life, the way it appears today, is not a result of a few big choices. Even though that's the thing that we look back on, we go, oh, I shouldn't have moved out of the state. Oh, I shouldn't have got into that relationship. Oh, I shouldn't have. We look at the big things. Well, I'm here to disrupt that mindset a bit. Your life experience right now is not so much a result of your big choices. Why those impact you, it's really a result of a bunch of small little choices made consistently over a long period of time. Because those are the habits and the behaviors that you've gotten into. So we can talk about willpower and how do I build willpower as if it's something that you can flex in the gym or something you can do crunches or abs or triceps and build, but it's not. The question you should ask, the answer you should be seeking is what does it take to make my choices become in alignment with the life that I say I want to live. Now when you say choices, it makes it really sober because even when you choose to sit down on yourself, it was a choice. So I ask you in this moment, what will it take you to decide to make the choice today? Don't even think about tomorrow, don't think about next week, but to make the choice today that's in alignment with your health goals. Make a choice today that's in alignment with your financial goals. It's the small things. It's the extra visit to Starbucks. It's the extra biscuit. It's the getting up early. It's 10 more crunches. It's doing squats every time you go to the bathroom. At least that's what I do. I do 10. I do 10 every time I go to the restroom. I'm already there. I'm just going to keep on going just because I want to stay in alignment with my goal. And my goal is to have a body that at least creates a double take or, or a triple take maybe. I don't know. I wanted to create a body that is in alignment with my goal. I want to be able to go paintballing with my nephews and my son the way I just did recently. I want to be able to go jet skiing. So when I look at my life and my lifestyle that I want to maintain, it requires me to hike a little longer. It requires me to eat more vegetables and protein. It requires me, my, my choice of how I want to live requires my alignment in what I put in my body or how I stay active in my body. So when I date, I don't, I don't do dinner dates. I'm not interested in doing dinner dates. You want to date me? Let's go on a hike. Let's go skating, ice skating, roller skating. Let's go on a walk. I, I want active dates in my dating experience because that's in alignment with my life's purpose. So what are you choosing? Let's not even look at willpower. Let's look at choices because choice is something you can control in every single moment. And the choice you made yesterday, if it wasn't alignment with your greatest goal and your highest purpose, okay, yesterday is yesterday. Make a new choice today. You're not ever condemned or sentenced to making the same choice over and over and over again. Every day, every moment, you have a new opportunity to make a new choice. People are just afraid, man. So many people are afraid of rejection of failure, but without failure, you have no success. If they've gone out and they've made all this progress, they're real happy. They go, go, go. They're growing, growing, growing. Boink. They hit this plateau. Wrong sport. Not a tennis player. Go play this. Boink. Racquetball. All of a sudden, working hard, not getting a result. Wrong thing. Wrong relationship. Wrong job. Wrong mission. So then they go out and play golf and they go, boom. <laughs> They don't even get the progress. <laughs> and they go, I didn't need to use the F word that many more times in my life, right? You know, different piece. Now that's what a dabbler does. And by the way, dabblers by their nature are unhappy. Think about this. Even with all the economic challenges that exist, most people in North America for sure 
have a better quality of life than 95% of the planet. 95% of the planet is living on what? How much? Two thirds of the planet, I should say, is living on $2 a day. Your worst nightmare is somebody else's greatest dream. Most of the planet's greatest dream. Your idea of economic downfall is somebody's dream. That's the truth. And so what happens though is, would you agree we have more choices, more freedoms, more opportunities today than any time in human history, yes or no? Are most people's happy, is their happiness tied to the quality of life they really have? Because we're a world now that's shallow. Most people are dabblers. They try something for a while, it doesn't work out, they do something else. Now you wouldn't be in this room for five days if you were a dabbler, but how many of you got to deal with some of these dabblers out there? Say I. Dabblers are the people you want to make sure you keep off your team or get off quickly, because they're going to quit anyway. And the time, energy, and effort it takes to train a dabbler has the same energy you could have a platinum player. And we're going to show you some ways to do that later on. But let me show you another path for a second before we show you the rest of the training effect. Let's take the path of what I call a stressor. Here's the stressor's philosophy. I find the way. Who can relate to this? Say I. I'm going to find the way I'm going to cheat it. So they take up a sport like tennis and it goes like this and they're doing really, really well. It's going really good. But eventually, boink, they hit a plateau. Here's the difference. Does the stressor quit? Ever quit? Yes or no? Absolutely not. What does the stressor do when it doesn't work out? What do they do? Do they settle for it? What if they actually get a little worse for a short time? What happens? They really get stressed when they go, oh, screw this, I'm going to find a way, I'm going to break through, I'm going to learn a book, I'm going to find something, I'm going to get a coach, I'm going to make this thing happen, I'm going to find a way, I'm going to find whatever it takes to make this thing happen. And they break through, ladies and gentlemen. Come on, they break through, ladies and gentlemen. And by the way, they break through and all of a sudden they start making progress and progress and they're so happy and all of a sudden, guess what happens? Boink. And they go, damn. How the hell? Well, how could that happen? I've been working my tail off. I just had this breakthrough. I just worked through this thing. I just fought through it. But by the way, do they hit another plateau? Yes or no? So, what happens here? Do they give up? Do they quit? Do they go to the wrong sport? What does the stressor do? They stress out. Shit, I'm going to find a way. I'm going to make this thing happen. I'm going to make this thing happen. Come on, figure something out. Let's find this thing. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to make more calls. I'm going to make this thing happen. And all of a sudden, eventually, what happens? Poof! Ladies and gentlemen, they break through again. Come on now. And by the way, they eventually get where they want to be. The problem is they're so stressed out by the time they get there, they're so exhausted they can't enjoy it. The human brain has this incredible capacity for guilt. And most people unconsciously let that roll over them and kick their butt and make a horrible life. I love guilt. Guilt is a tool. Guilt is a weapon. Guilt does not have to be a bad thing. It's not like I perpetuate, but I'm like, I love that I feel bad when I don't do a good job. Most people hate that about themselves. I love that feeling. I'm like, I didn't do a good job there. Next time I will. So some people, guilt is discouragement. Other people, it's a signal for learning. To me, guilt is a signal for learning. It is the body and the brain, the spirit, knowing what is right, knowing what is wrong knowing what's great, knowing what's mediocre. And it's saying, hey, do a little better. Now, if it's translated into a negative impulse, then some people call it guilt. But I'm like, I'm totally cool with guilt. I, you know, I think it's good that we feel bad when we do something that is below our standard or that's not right, because that impulse to go, I want to do that better. The way I see it is that competition in and of itself is not good or bad. And, and this is like the monk mindset on 99% of things, that this mug is not good or bad. It could be filled with water or it could be filled with poison. Yes. And so competition, I'll give you an example. Yeah. As monks, our competition is in how much love and respect we show to each other. That's your competition? Like that's what you compete on. Or how, so, how long can we meditate for? No, no, no. <laughs> I can so meditate it. longer than yeah. you. So if any monk is sitting, and I did this plenty of times. Really? If I sat there and I thought, oh yeah, look at him. He's scratching his back. He got uh, out like that. Moved. If your meditation just got destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> All the value. And so monks will never ask how long you meditate. 
they focus on how deep you meditate. And someone who meditates deep doesn't go on about how deep it was. But but you compete for showing respect. You compete for serving each other. You compete for how well you can collaborate. And I feel like you live this. Yes. Like yes, I, I, yes. I feel like you have no, this. I didn't you're, used to do that. Yeah. For the last but you did it now. Like, you think like a monk. Like I feel like we're always trying to find a way where we can be better friends to each other support and support each other. Each other. Yeah. And so you're competing on that. And and that's a positive competition that I think you can have. So you can still use. And this is the beautiful thing about the monk mindset. You can use. Any, <laughs> I can meditate longer than yeah. you. So if any monk is sitting, and I did this plenty of times. Really? If I sat there and I thought, oh yeah, look at him, he's scratching his back. He got right. out like he that. Moved. Your meditation just got destroyed. <laughs> right? All the value. And so monks will never ask how long you meditate. They focus on how deep you meditate. And someone who meditates deep doesn't go on about how deep it was. But but you compete for showing respect. You compete for serving each other. You compete for how well you can collaborate. And I feel like you live this. Yes. Like yes, I, yes. I, I feel like you have no, this. I didn't you're used to do that. Yeah. For the last but you did it now. Like, you think like a monk. Like I feel like we're always trying to find a way where we can be better friends to each other support and support each other. Each other. Yeah. And so you're competing on that. And and that's a positive competition that I think you can have. So you can still use. And this is the beautiful thing about the monk mindset. You can use any. Yeah. Thing in a positive way. One thing that's true about life is that things are always changing around you, always. Whether you are moving into a new season or in in school, and all of a sudden your kids' school schedules change, or you're moving into a new season of work, and all of a sudden your work life is changing, or you're moving into a new season of your marriage or of your health or of anything. Life changes all the time, which is why it's really important to be self-aware and to make the small changes that help you enjoy and seize all the opportunities from the season of life, work, family, relationships that you're in right now. We always have been trained to focus on the results. So people ask, "What do you want in life?" And I'm like, "Forget that. That's the worst question to ask someone." Because when you ask what you want, that's when the ads come in, and you're like, "Oh, I want that car. I want that home. I want that dress. I want that body. I want whatever it is." I my question to you is, "What do you want to wake up and be every day? Like, what do you want to wake up and do every day? What's the process that yeah. you're in love with?" So we're thinking about the result, whereas my question is, "Forget the result. What's the process that you're in love with doing?" So start there first of all. Don't start your journey of saying I want to be a movie director because I want to, you know, I want to hit the blockbuster charts. I want to do this. Don't make it about that. Like, don't don't be like I want to be a singer because I want to be Ariana Grande, right? Like, that's not the point. That's just a result. Do you love singing every day? And I realized this with a very honest question to myself. I'm really passionate about football, soccer. I absolutely love the game. I grew up on it. I'm still a huge fan. I missed out on it when I was a monk. I've been catching up ever since. <laughs> like I'm like, oh, I, any football game. I was just in London last week, and I made sure I went. I didn't couldn't see a game live, but I went and watched it at a, at a bar in London. And I love the energy. I'm so passionate about soccer. I don't have what it takes to be a soccer player. Yeah. Like I do not want to wake up at 4 a.m. <laughs> I wake up at 4 a.m. to meditate. When I was a monk, I wake up at six, five、uh, thirty a.m. now to meditate. I do not want to wake up at four a.m. to go out on a raining pitch and play soccer.、Mm-hmm. Like I don't want to be in the gym for four hours a day. I want to meditate for four hours a day, but I don't want to me-、uh, play soccer for four hours a day and then be in the gym and train. I'm not envious of any athlete in the world because it takes a different type of mindset. If you had a kid, obviously you do have a kid. But say if you had like a twenty-year-old and he's just a doper, where he wake and bakes and doesn't get anything done, he's just always like hanging out with his friends and playing video games, and he's just a loser.、Yeah. I, I, I wish there was a way you could show someone like that. Like I know that you're getting some comfort and satisfaction out of just laying around, doing nothing, eating, getting fat, but. Your life would feel better and richer if you had a goal. You chase that goal. You accomplish some things. You would get 
this boost of confidence, you get this boost of self-esteem, like whatever it is that you're into doing. Maybe you're into drawing comic books. Maybe yeah. you're into uh, but making pottery or sculptures or who, but find whatever the f- that is and pursue that instead of doing nothing. Like the people that are doing nothing, those are the real people. I mean, look, m- doing something might be as simple as like that Alex Honnold guy. He just climbs rocks. But he's world class rock climber. Though. It's something. But and it's also a goal of his, of yeah. his, and he's also the best at it. Right? Yes. Yeah. But those those people who smoke pot all day and do that, those are also the guys who hate on Joe Rogan for being in shape. You know what I'm saying? Or being disciplined, or get on Kevin Hart's Instagram and hate on. You know what I'm saying? Because they don't. It's it's their own insecurities. I see what you're saying, but I I would assume they would get motivated by seeing other people do something with their lives like that should be motivating not yeah but if you grew up if you grew up with losers and you're around a bunch of people with shitty attitudes especially if it's in your household <clears throat> i was very lucky that uh both my mom and my stepdad they're not they're not they're the least hater people i've ever met in my life they're just not haters in any way like if someone's doing well they're always like wow look at this guy or like wow look at her yeah, or, wow celebrate. look at him there was never any hate in my house in terms of uh other people's success but if you grew up with a dad and your dad's like yeah these all these rich assholes this he thinks she's a badass and this you know these people that look at other people's success and instead of saying wow that guy did a lot of work like the way i'm a successful person but the way i look at kevin hart he exhausts me you know or the rock those guys exhaust me i'm like jesus christ like i feel lazy next to those guys like they do so much like those guys are so overbearingly ambitious you know but some people they see that and they compare themselves and they don't like it so they get started getting really shit. and it's like a natural feeling to try to chip away at that person I believe in human possibility human potential and I think that one of our biggest limiting beliefs is the belief of how limited we really are and so my interest is to give people the science to begin to understand how powerful they really are and i think that science really is the language that does that really well and and the new sciences like quantum physics and uh, neuroplasticity neuroscience neuroendocrinology you know uh, psycho neuroimmunology the mind body connection epigenetics all of those sciences point the finger at possibilities so i want to create a language for people from a philosophical or theoretical standpoint for them to begin to understand what's possible. But then I want to be able to have those people begin to wire that information in their brain completely because learning is making new connections right in the brain. But remembering is maintaining and sustaining those connections and it's so much easier to lose our vision than to remember it, right? So then we have to begin to hardwire the brain or install the neurological hardware in preparation for an experience. So the more people understand what they're doing and why, then the how gets easier. So I wanna then set up the conditions in an environment, in a, in a, in a workshop where people can begin to apply or personalize what they learn so that they can have an experience and experience then further enriches the brain but the prize of an experience is an emotion and once you start feeling unlimited once you start feeling abundant once you start feeling worthy now you're teaching your body chemically to understand what your mind is intellectually understood so knowledge is for the mind and experiences for the body and people begin to embody the truth that philosophy now if they can repeat it over and over again it'll become innate in them and become natural second nature will become easy they begin to master that philosophy so i want people to begin to understand that thoughts are very powerful feelings drive our thoughts and that they can begin to create a better life for themselves once they understand some of these principles what's a few simple things that they should be doing right now to have a checklist to do before the end of the year to then crush for a whole 12 months moving forward. All right. I'm going to give you something called the ladder of personal finance. 
which tells you where your money should go. Okay, this is just step by step, put your money here. And if you want to know all the details about it, you can check out the system. So it's in the book too? The, the, it's yeah. in great detail in the book. Got it. All right. So if you've got some money lying around, what should you do with it? First of all, if you've got a 401k match at work, you should max that out. That's free money. Take advantage of it. And if you're not sure what that means, go to your HR person and say, does this company match any 401k contributions? If they say yes, do what I said. Uh, next, if you've got debt, pay it off. Pay it off aggressively. You know, what's interesting is that most people in debt who I talk to don't actually know how much they owe. And that's shocking. Oh. You would think, of course they would know. No, they don't. Because who wants to proactively- Stare at their debt all day. Yeah, and just feel bad about it. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? You feel much better when you have a plan. And the number one question I ask folks uh, when they tell me they have debt, I say, number one, do you know how much you owe? They never do. Number two, for the rare people who say, you know, 15,000 or 70,000, whatever, I say, what is your debt payoff date? You can actually Ooh. plug it in. You can pay, uh, plug in a debt payoff calculator online. You can map it all out and you will be able to know the exact month your debt will be paid off. Based on how much you're spending right now. Based on how much you're contributing to that debt payoff. Now, you will be able to see that if you add an extra 50 bucks a month or 100 bucks a month, that thing will actually oftentimes shorten by years because of the interest. It doesn't matter if it's gonna take you three months or four years to pay off your debt. It doesn't matter to me. What matters is that you know the date. Okay, so that's number two, pay off any debt you've got. Three, if you've got money left over, uh, go to your Roth IRA. And if you can, max that out. That's a great tax advantage to count. It's a gross tax deferred, is that yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, um, uh, so that's three. That's three. Okay. It's actually post tax money. And then four, if you still got money, you're going to go to back to your 401k, which is uh, another tax advantage to count. You're going to max that out. If you still got money, you're going to create a non taxable, non retirement account and just put your money in there. Now, there's a few other wrinkles to this. There's HSAs available. There's also your emergency fund that's talked about in the book and all these things. They're details. But that just shows you when you've got money, this is where you go. There's a structured way of thinking about it. A ladder towards a ladder. financial success. Exactly. And if you follow the steps, it's almost like the like a waterfall. It just goes from step one to step two to step three. And your money's going where it needs to go automatically. And you will feel great. You'll feel great, which is so important. And also, you're going to look at your accounts and see debt's going down. Investment and savings are going up. And all of a sudden you wake up six months from now, you're like, oh my God, I didn't realize I have that much saved in my savings account. That's because of the decision you made today. Mm.